folks, Joseph A. Sabora here, and I'm doing a movie review this week. It's a stop-motion animated fantasy comedy that came out on August 5th, 1983 from executive producer George Lucas and writer, producer, animator, and director John Cordy called Twice Upon a Time. A story about unlikely heroes trying to save the day from an evil madman from creating nightmare bombs. Well, this criminally underrated little gem, unfortunately, um, just got released recently on DVD as part of the Warner Archives. That includes two versions. One was the original PG-rated theatrical release, and the other one was the original uncut release that provided some raunchy dialogue. And that was the one that actually aired on HBO three times uh, back in the 80s, which uh, Cordy had put a stop to it and decided to just release his version instead on other um, pay TV networks like Showtime, Spectrum. Yeah, I know we don't have Spectrum here, but because we had Select TV and, and On TV at the time. And I know the film had been played on several networks like the Disney Channel, Cartoon Network, and I believe it did air it on Channel 14, KCOP Los Angeles, from where I am. And I know I watched it back then when I was a little kid. I think we rented it on VHS a long time ago too, just to check it out. And yeah, I, I really did enjoy this movie a lot. I, I'm surprised not many people talked about this. I mean, I, I know there's several people who actually remembered it. I mean, mostly because they had watched the old VHS tape of it. And, and they were very curious that there was an unrated cut that actually had some you know, foul language in it. And that's interesting. And yeah, that's why this movie had provided some bootleg copies of it. But now that we finally got the, the DVD release that's released by Warner Archives, we now get to see both of them again. Also provides some commentary in the mix. So, so now we get to listen to the original creators behind the film. Which, by the way, this film also had the careers of Henry Selleck, because he had worked together with John Cordy as well as David Fincher, who went on to become a director. <laughs> Hard to believe that these two guys have become well known for, for these movies. So yeah, what are the odds here? But the film does um, feature improvised dialogue, you know, coming from the voice actors and comedians out there. It has a blend of live action filled with traditional 2D animation, all done in paper cut like form. That's why it was called Limage, Ani Limage Animation and a mix of stop motion. So it was cool having to see some shots of, of uh, black and white. I'm having to see some black and white uh, live action photography where you start seeing all the motions that's in the, in a fast pace or slow pace or any other kind of, yeah like you can it's like when they try to stop time they it just it sometimes it goes really fast or or very slow and in several of those shots of like like for instance you know they they show the shot of the city you know how it's moving really fast and and very slow and then you know, you saw like a little girl on the Ferris wheel, and you saw uh, one girl, you know, running around at the beach, and then lots of buildings, you know, all around. Some of them looked like they were collapsing too. Wow, I mean, this was just amazing, the way they did this. Yeah. Now, uh, production company, the Ladd Company, which was uh, owned by Alan Ladd Jr., uh, had some financial troubles at the time, so they couldn't decide which movie they, they should release um, first, because they had two films that were on schedule. One was The Right Stuff, 
and the other one is this movie, the Twice Upon a Time. They were trying to figure it out that they were going to either give it a limited release or a wide release. Well, they decided to give this film a limited release, you know, just to save money. And same here with the right stuff. And sad to say, both of these films had failed at the box office. So that's a shame. But either way, I'm just glad this movie finally got released on DVD, so now we can finally get to watch it. In fact, I do have a copy of the film already, so that's good. Now I can watch it any time I like. And I'm glad to see that they finally put this movie on widescreen, because it was really meant to be shot this way. But Anyway, let's get to the film. It stars Lorenzo Music, yeah, a veteran voice actor who's sadly no longer with us. He passed away in 2001. He's been best known for doing some voice work, such as playing the, the doorman in Rhoda the TV show, along with um, Peter Bankman in The Real Ghostbusters, and of course, Garfield. Yeah, I always think of him as Garfield, though, whenever I hear that voice. Julie Payne, Marshall, Sir Efron went on to do other stuff, too. Yeah, I know he was also the writer of, of THX 1138. Hamilton Camp, James Crenna, Paul Fries, yeah, legendary uh, voice actor who's passed away in 1986. Yeah, he was a legend. And Judith Cohan. It's written by John Cordy, along with Charles Swenson, Sulia Kennedy, and Bill Cordy. And it's directed by John Cordy and Charles Swenson. The movie began set in the busy city known as Den, which is shot in San Francisco and Berkeley, all in black and white, where we meet the townspeople known as the Rushers, which they do exactly what normal people would do during the day. They spend time working at their business offices, as well as going to the park, the beaches, the carnivals, lots of places, as well as driving in cars, trucks, buses, airplanes, you know, walking around the street you know, as pedestrians, uh, lots of shops everywhere, uh, buildings, uh, you name it. It's one big town until at night they want to fall asleep inside of their apartments or houses or any kind. While the town is being lied into two worlds collide into creating dreams for the rushers. One is a bright and cheerful for Wally, which the green sleeves and this figment of imagination, yeah, those uh, tiny grape-like creatures, to actually bring in sweet dreams to them, while the other is the Merkworks, which is a dark and dingy factory that's home to the vultures known as the Minions. No, not those other kinds of Minions as we know it. You know, those yellow uh, cell-like uh, creatures like the Twinkies type. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's another story. It's won by an evil maniac ruler known as Synonymous Botch, who follows uh, Greeny's efforts by bringing in the rushers to create those non-stop waking nightmares by using all these nightmare bombs to be sent throughout the entire city of Din. But he uses his vultures to kidnap the figs and the green sleeves just before he was about to write an SOS to Feroli. But meanwhile, we meet two misfits known as Ralph, an all-purpose animal who basically can change into different form of shapes and sizes, such as a tiger, lion, kangaroo, a bee, a birds and all that. I mean, he, he can change into anything. And we also meet his sidekick is a tall man who doesn't speak, he's a mime, known as Mum. And they wanted working together as garbage men, because you know, they really needed to work real badly, until suddenly they meet Greensleeves' niece, known as Flora Friona, who wants to become an inspiring actress someday, but she was never given a chance. But anyway, she found her uncle's uh, message and was uh, destined to find him. 
But Botch has spied the entire trio by using his robot gorilla, yeah, a video gorilla known as Ebor, yeah, which he has a TV screen that shows various clips of movies and TV shows, especially uh, the ones that were produced by George Lucas, such as Star Wars and Indiana Jones. They even had a clip of Happy Days to join in, yeah, with the Fonz. And also some Looney Tunes as well. But anyway, he wants up introducing himself to them by offering uh, Ralph and Mim a job for him to actually steal the main spring of the cosmic clock that's located inside the shop um, that's in Din. While Fiona wants up um, working as the damsel in distress in one of Botch's nightmares that he's creating inside his studio. But once Ralph and Mum had tried to do that, they went inside the cosmic clock inside the shop, which we actually saw the Snoopy poster ne next to it. Yeah, that was really cool. They went inside where we saw like a huge clock face and Mum actually had uh, pulled the lever, keep switching it back and forth, which it actually freezes time by going into slow motion and and fast motion throughout the entire city until suddenly the whole clock had shut down. So they stole the, the main spring which um, that Botch had used all the the vultures to do exactly what they were chosen which they lost their fetters. Now we meet a fairy godmother also known as FGM which she likes to be referred to had offered um, Ralph and Mom an excitement because they realized that they'd been tricked by giving them free dimes in order to call for help. Well, they tried to do so, but that didn't work out because by the time they went inside the office, they spotted all these nightmare bombs, which Mom accidentally uh, had let one loose. Uh, just after he was trying out the typewriter. Then suddenly FJM had um, hired a uh, dim-witted but muscle bomb named Rod Rescueman to help them out. But of course Rod was more interested in saving the damsel in distress, which is Friona, just as you know he spotted her being attacked by a gorilla <laughs> until Rod actually saved her by going inside um, his gymnasium that's located inside a giant football. Unfortunately, when Friona escapes, she wants a falling, and Rod was just about to rescue her twice, but she had trouble looking for his cape, and then decided to wash it until it's finally done, and he was about to save her until Ralph and Mum had finally came just in the nick of time. So Rod and his trio had stormed away inside Botch's factory with the help of Sketchbopper, who had worked with Botch as a screenwriter to write several of the Nightmare scripts and just until he was about to commit suicide. And stop Botch from his uh, evil scheming plans by using the Big Red One to detonate all the bombs before time is restarted. Now this was a stunning, hilarious, and very creative animated feature that deserves to be seen more than once. It's your typical superhero story where they're about to save the entire city from an evil villain. But these aren't ordinary superheroes. They tend to screw up every chance they got. Because they, they knew that by accident that they were working for Botch until they found out what was happening. and. There you have it. It seems to me that they're just there just for the job. You know, Ralph, the all-purpose animal, was just working as a garbage man just to earn more money, you know, along with his sidekick, Mum, who doesn't speak, but he does screw up it every time he does. You know, he's just kicking and, and punching things and all that stuff. Not even listening to uh, Ralph, but <laughs> there you go. Until... They met Frona, who was just there just to look for her uncle, 
you know, even though she wants to become an actress herself, and I could tell. But either way, um, I thought Ralph, the all-purpose animal, was the real hero of the film, and it definitely shows. I mean, it doesn't matter, you know, if, if it could be a superhero like uh, Rod Rescue Man right there. You know, we can have an animal as a hero, too. I mean, let's face it, Ralph can change into different kinds of animals in order to stop them. So, that's interesting. And by the way, I thought Fiona Fauna was also very pretty, beautiful, and very talented, too. Because I could tell she wants to become an actress. I don't blame her. Yeah, Rod Rescue Man, you know, just your, your dim-witted... Um, superhero was not that smart but he was just there just to save the damsel in distress and nothing more but hey <laughs> what do we know but at least they did work together so that's the good thing about it some of this botch however yeah I mean he was hilarious as the villain I mean it let's face it he does come up with all this funny dialogue that definitely got away with it somehow Mostly because it's written by Bill Cordery, which um, in the original cut, the, the one that HBO had aired, which is now on DVD, you know, there were like several uh, dialogues that they used, which he sure had came up with. You know, I know there were some fart jokes too, and, and plus uh, even uh, Ralph had said the word piss in, in the movie. So, geez. Now I can see why Cordy um, somehow didn't want to show that scene in uh, in all pay TV networks. Because he wanted to keep it as uh, family friendly as possible. I could understand. But it did have adult humor, so it really needed that. It doesn't matter anyway. It had some veteran voice actors right here. I mean, they did a good job. Paul Freeze was very, you know, very impressive as a narrator. He also played like several roles in the movie. And all the other actors, you know, besides Lorenzo Music, we had Julie Payne, Hamilton Camp, and Judith Conahan, you know, everything. And yeah, don't forget uh, FGM, <laughs> Fairy Godmother. I, I remember that scene in the movie where, where she was actually doing the tests on the Rod Rescue Man by saving the devil in distress. She actually created, yeah, because she was about to hire him for the job. And suddenly, <laughs> he sets the whole table on fire, pretending that she's the damsel in distress. And he was trying to do it, but then the whole, uh, but the entire room is like moving back and forth. <laughs> and explodes after that. <laughs> That's just hilarious. Also, the animation is very stunning too. They they had a mix of paper cut 2D animation filled with stop motion and also they used black and white photography in the mix so it makes the film fit just right something I never thought I'd seen before and I like that. It was well made. It's hard to believe that uh, one of the crew including uh, Henry Selleck had did all this and David Fincher too. Wow, I mean, hard to believe. And George Lucas, um, who produced this movie, I mean, it really shows that he can really do an animated film very well. And I kind of wish he had done something like that, which I know he did, especially since his latest film called Strange Magic, yeah, kind of failed to do so. This is a real deal. And and yeah, it was uh, very impressive. Um, some great editing too, and some great choice of music that they have. Yeah, it's a great soundtrack. Yeah, they use uh, Bruce Hornsby and other artists too, like Marie McDonnell uh, with Tom Ferguson too. It's, it even has uh, Lawrence Welk and his orchestra to join in. Yeah, it was perfect. It's a uh, either way, it's a. Uh, very well made movie and it's just sad that this movie was criminally underrated that's why it needs to be talked more than once so that way you know we can finally get what we we have and I'm just happy that the film finally got released on DVD 
But I do wish they had put it on Blu-ray too. For Warner Archives. So maybe someday they might take their chances. But either way, I definitely recommend this movie. So anyway, I give Trice Upon a Time 5 stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.